Well, we're in a series titled Loving the Bride, and um, really I have a little video I want to show you that's just going to set the, set the tone and set the scene for us this morning, um, be- and this is titled Would You Marry Somebody Like This? So can we look at this video together? Emma, these past seven months have been incredible, and I mean, honestly, when I saw you seven months ago, I knew. I knew from that moment that I wanted to spend the rest of my life with you. You're kind, beautiful, smart. I, I can't picture a more perfect woman. So, Emma Lily Thompson, will you marry me? Yes, 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 yes. 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 <laughs> I have to see other guys on the side, but yes. Wait, what? Uh, what are the guys? What, what are you talking about? I'm the perfect woman. Just like you said, I'm going to have gourmet meals for us every single night. Our house is going to be perfect. Oh, it's going to be amazing, babe. And I mean, you don't really expect me to be a one-man kind of woman anyway. Uh, no, that's actually like a, a, a big part of marriage. Like, you and me. Together. Yeah, but I can't give up every guy. I mean, that's asking a little much, don't you think? A, a little... A little... I just asked you to marry me. If we're married, you can't see anyone else. That, that no, that that's Thanks, wait. You're, okay, I'm, okay I'm shh. It's okay. Listen to me. Listen to me. Look at me. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that. You're right. I was wrong. Thank I you. totally understand where you're coming from. This is our moment. And we're going to be so happy together every single day except once a week. Well, uh, once a week. Okay. What Just no. simply once a week. Did you, did you not listen to anything every other I just year? said? No. On a what? leap year? N- no. Okay, okay. Emma, I, 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 I can't. I, I can't. Once a week on a leap year, and you're gonna freak out? Emma, we're, we're done. What? Babe, you were just asking me to marry you. Are you kidding me? Seriously? Really? Oh. Oh. Would you marry someone like that? That's a lot of blank expressions. I know my answer, but would you marry somebody like that? I'd hope for most of us the answer would be no. For the majority of us, at least, the response should be no. Because in marriage, I want to be your one and only. And I want you to want the same. And it's amazing, it's a wonder that Jesus loves His bride, the church, in this way. He wants us exclusively. He wants for us to have eyes only for Him. He doesn't want to share us, His church. He wants to have the church's heart, her loyalty, her devotion, and to grow to a much, much higher degree than what you and I could ever really fathom. And sadly, many individual believers and indeed churches today, although they may not say it, act as the girl that you've just seen in the video. I hope it was clear to you that she was super excited about the prospect of getting married. I mean, I believe that she truly loved that young man, but she was just not willing to be exclusively his. And Jesus is calling his bride to be his alone, entirely. And if you hear nothing else today, if you have to go early, I want you to open your heart to this truth, the commander of heaven's armies, the all-sufficient, all-powerful one, Jesus Christ, sitting at the right-hand side of God, is calling you to Him, to be His and His alone. And we see beautifully in the book of Ephesians how God uses the picture of marriage to describe the relationship between Jesus and His church. And I'd like for you to open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, and you can read with me. And I'll read from verse 25 through to verse 33. It says, Husbands, Love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he may present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. 
In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. Let me just read that last verse for us again. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. The title of this message today is Two Becoming One Flesh. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. The healthy, godly union of husband and wife merges two people in such a way that your interest becomes my interest. Your concerns, uh, my concerns, what, what is difficult for you in life, I'm going to stand with you and we're going to carry the challenges and face the obstacles together. What influences you is going to have an impact on me. We don't remain strangers of one another in this picture. No, we come together and merge to become as one flesh. And we see this right from the start, you know, that God had such an incredible union in mind. In Genesis chapter 2, we read the following. Then the man said this, and he's speaking about Eve. He says this, he says, this at least or at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. The relationship that Jesus longs for regarding His church is akin to this level of intimacy, closeness, devotion, and commitment. Therefore, how we, the individual members of the church, relate to one another is so very important. It's so important how we treat one another and how we conduct ourselves regarding one another. Because we are the body. We are the bride. And when we come together as we do in a, in a setting like this this morning, our question has always got to be this. Was He pleased with what we brought? Did He enjoy our company? When we sing, did we honor Him? When we gave, did we give in a way that speaks of our devotion to Him? Are we conducting ourselves in a way towards one another where we are showing each other honor and bringing one another into more? You know, in Acts 4, verse 32, we, we have a glimpse into uh, the early church, and it says the following, Now the full number of those who believed were one in heart and soul. If we are to be the healthy bride that Jesus longs for, then we should be one in heart and soul. And this doesn't happen automatically, let me tell you. Would you agree? Just by merit of becoming a Christ follower doesn't mean that you automatically have the sense of unity that just slots you in with the rest of all of the children of Jesus across the island or across wherever you may find yourself. If that was the case, if unity was just this automatic uh, thing that happened when you become a Christ follower, then they would have been like one church that everybody would belong to, a mega church just per location. But unity isn't something that happens automatically. Unity is a choice. We have to decide. We have to fight for it and we have to work for it. A little bit like marriage. Just by merit of being married doesn't mean that things are going to work out. Who's married here and who can attest to that? Just by merit of saying, I do, it didn't mean that for the rest of your life there will never be a fight again. There will never be problems again. From now on, you guys are going to see everything exactly the same. No, actually, you have to choose in marriage, day in and day out. You know, I grew up in a, I grew up in a home where my mom was a devout believer. She was a devout Christian. and My father, equally devout atheist. It was this really two, uh, clash of two kingdoms. And sadly, for the majority of their marriage, I recall very, very little love between the two of them. Just because they were married did not mean that they were for one another. Do you know what it means to be for somebody else? You want to see them succeed. You want to see them come into everything that they can be. 
You want to ensure that there is success. And their win becomes your joy when you are for somebody else. I hardly ever saw that between my mother and father. They were married, but it didn't mean they had unity. They certainly weren't for one another in heart and soul, as far as I can tell. There was very little ongoing reciprocal laying down of life for one another. And we as believers, as individual members of His church, we have to decide. We have to set our minds on being united. We have to set our minds on working together. We have to set our minds on forgiving one another. We have to set our minds into bringing one another into more of the Lord. We have to set our minds on devotion, humility, and undeterred, relentless focus towards continuing to be of one heart and one soul, knowing that this is Jesus' heart for His bride. And His heart is for us to be without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she may be holy and without blemish. But we have our part to play. Jesus would look at us in this church and, and every church on the island, and He would say, I want for the bride, my people, to be spotless and without blemish. Two shall become one flesh. So what is needed for two to become one flesh? What will we have to see in this church and in churches and in Christendom in general to be united with Christ in this way? Well, the first thing is this. We need to have one identity. We, we should all carry the same identity because knowing your identity has a profound impact on how you live. Knowing who you are directly impacts your decision making, your thinking, your actions, and your attitude. Some of you may say, well, I'm not so sure about that. But I can tell you I have first-hand experience of this. Your identity, how you see yourself, what you believe about yourself, impacts how you live your life. When my parents finally got a divorce, it affected everything every area of my life. I was 15, 16 years old. It had a profound impact on how I saw myself. In the space of nine months, we went from what I thought was a happy family to a broken mess. Now, in retrospect, I understand today that there was a lot that happened up until this point in time, but as a young boy, it just all seemed to disintegrate around me in the space of nine months. I went from being a confident young boy in a good middle-class home with more than enough worldly things around me, with no real concerns or worries, to a boy who suddenly did a, didn't have a father anymore. No money, no prospects, no security, and seemingly, through my eyes, no hope for the future. And it affected every area of my life. It affected how I thought. It affected my mood. It affected how, uh, what, I, what I regarded as important and what I didn't regard as important. I became afraid. Self-confidence plummeted. Self-belief disappeared. Joy went on a long extended holiday out of my life. I felt I no longer matched up with other boys and the children within my school. You know, just... This is a secret, and I didn't share it with any of my school for two years. For two years, I kept on going to school, and I just didn't tell anybody about this. But I was changing. I didn't feel I matched up. It affected my schoolwork. I became depressed. I became lonely, and at times, I was violent. And I look at that boy today, and I go like, man, who were you? My identity, who I thought I was, how I saw myself was rocked and it affected every area of my life. Your environment, your culture, your life experiences, both in the past and today, it impacts on how you see yourself. And while it's positive for some, many carry a burden. Many see themselves through a, blo a, a broken lens or a tainted lens, and you see yourself through the lens of how you were bullied at school and what people thought of you. You see yourself through that lens of your parents' divorce or maybe perhaps your own. You see yourself through the lens of your health and your physical well-being or maybe the lack thereof. 
You see yourself through that lens of undeserved abuse or neglect or indifference from those who should have loved you most. Some see themselves through the lens of their greatest disappointments, their unfulfilled dreams, and their unreached potential. I remember shortly after high school, the social circle that I was in, and I, I wasn't in such a great social circle just by merit of everything that had happened in my life, you know, but on the periphery of our social circle, my friends, there was this one girl I was introduced to on occasion, very, very pretty girl, very beautiful. But her, but her friends and, and the circle she moved in meant that we only really crossed over every now and again. She was a friend of a friend that was that kind of thing. And I remember on occasion I saw this girl again and it looked like she'd been in a car crash. And I, and I went to one of my mates and I was like, what happened there? You know, I mean, what happened? And he told me that her boyfriend beat her, her, beats her up regularly. And I remember looking at this girl going like, you, you, you're beautiful. I mean, you why is she staying with this dude? And it transpired. It was, it was just regularly happening to this girl. And the reality was this, that she saw herself through a lens that had her believe, this is what I deserve. This is who I am, and you know, this is what I'm good for. Her identity shaped her actions, determined the trajectory of her life impacted her in a profound way. And what we do without knowing it is that we place our life experiences and the opinions of other people at the very core of who we are. And we live from that place, from the center of the opinions of our experiences and the people around us, those both who loved us and those maybe we just shared life with in seasons. And Jesus is saying to us, I want to be at the core of who you are. I want to be at the center of who you are. I see everything that's happened to you. I've been there throughout every life experience that you faced. You don't know it, but I was there. And I want to be at the core of who you are. I want to give you your identity. I want you to live from me. I want you to listen to my voice. I want you to respond to my opinion of what you're worth. I want to exclusively determine and shape your identity. Jesus is saying to you today. We read in Galatians 3.28, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. You are all one. In Christ Jesus. And this is what's being said here, and it's so wonderful. That which is most widely accepted as the determining factors of how you see yourself must fall away. No longer look through the grid of slave or free. No longer see the grid of South African or Irish or Manx. No longer look at white or black, short or or tall, thin or fat, blonde, redhead, brunette, rich, poor, popular, despised, male or female. All these things will give you an identity that ultimately, apart from Jesus, is flawed. Ultimately, an identity apart from Jesus is flawed. Why? Because Colossians 1 says this, from verse 17 onwards, I believe that Jesus, through Him, everything was made for Him. You were made through Him, for Him. Your identity should flow from Him. All these things will give you an identity that is flawed apart from Jesus. And maybe apart from Jesus, you were somebody who brought out the worst in others. Maybe you were a drunk. Maybe a thief. A liar, an adulterer, an addict. Maybe things have been done to you and it, you just can't get rid of the pain. Maybe you were selfish or manipulative or proud, lonely or hopeless or afraid. But with me, Jesus would say, with me, you are a chosen race. With me, you are a royal priesthood. With me, you are a holy nation, 
A people for His possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who called you out of darkness into a marvelous light. We should listen to what Jesus says about us. Your identity determines your destiny and God wants His people to share the same identity. He wants for us when we come together like this corporately, for all of us to live from that place of Jesus is the core of who I am. And what He thinks of me is all that matters. Whether I come in here with a helicopter and land on the helipad or whether I crawl in here because I've got so little, I am a child of the living God. And I come together with you because you are the same. My identity and yours, we are one. So Jesus would look at a man named Saul. And Saul in the Bible, this guy was a murderer. He facilitated terror. This guy, he was so self-conceited, arrogant, bombastic. He was a tyrant. People would look at him. Christians would fear him. And Jesus would look at them saying, that's not who you are. I want to make you. I want you to be. And Jesus meets him. And Saul becomes Paul. And God says, now, now he will be an instrument in my hand to carry my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel. And I believe God's heart is the same for all of us here today. For us to be instruments in His hand. For us to carry His name wherever we go. Whether it's into our high school, or places of work, or hospital, or friends, or family. Instruments in His hand to carry His name wherever we find ourselves. Whoever you are today, whatever you have done or has been done to you, hear my voice, please. Jesus is saying, Let me determine who you are. Hear me. He wants His church to have one identity. That's the first thing. If we're going to become one flesh with Him, the the, the bridegroom and the bride. The second is this. He wants us to be of one faith. Jesus is both inclusive and exclusive. And I'm going to go through this point very quickly. He's inclusive in that He will welcome everybody. At the front of this church, the doors are always open. Who you are, what you are, where you've come from, what you believe, you can come in. Whether you're a Muslim, whether you're a Buddhist, whether you bow the knee to Hare Krishna, whether you're a Satanist, whatever, whether you're an atheist, you are super welcome into this church. But once you get in here, it's Jesus. It's exclusive in here. In here, we are about Jesus. You are super welcome, and we want you to come and experience what it looks like and feels like to be among the people of God. But here, we worship Jesus and Him alone. In 2 Timothy, Paul is speaking to young Timothy, and he says to him, What you have heard from me, keep us the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. And, and kind of you may say, well, Paul, why did you tell Timothy that? I mean, the guy was running so well. He was running so hard. Why was it necessary for you to tell him to keep teaching the same things? Well, Paul knew that Satan will never rest in his endeavors to distort and dilute and disrupt the pure message of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so Paul warns young Timothy, he says, For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead uh, instead to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. He's speaking of the church. Listen, he's not speaking of the world out there. He's speaking of those who come to church, those who are in the body of Christ. That the time will come that people will gather for themselves teachers who will teach what people want to hear. And here's the thing that you need to understand. Your flesh will never really want to continue to hear what the message of the Bible is. It's always going to gravitate over time towards that which is comfortable for you. Because the flesh doesn't want to hear, die to self, pick up a cross, follow Jesus daily. Die to self, pick up a cross, and follow Jesus daily. Some time ago, I sat with a man and I showed him from various places in the New Testament just how his choices and his lifestyle was not, was not matching up with what, what we read in the New Testament. And the gentleman looked at me and he said to me, well, uh, you know, everything you showed me, I, I'm, I'm going to take it as a guidance, but I'm not going to take it as, as uh, instructions for my life because it wasn't in red. I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, you know what? If Jesus said it, I'll follow it. But you know what? What you read, it was from other letters. I'm, I'm not going to listen to that. And I was like, okay. I'm not sure where we go from here. But you know what? 
And it's, it's, it's actually becoming more and more common that what is written in the book, what is written in God's Word, is, is not automatically to be found wherever people call themselves churches nowadays. I heard about this one church that uh, the pastor said, listen, we don't teach anything that Paul wrote because Paul was a homophobic bigot. And I'm thinking, okay, okay, he wrote half of the New Testament, he wrote 13 books, that's a lot of New Testament you're kind of throwing away there, you know, I mean, people out there are teaching weird and wonderful things. And for us, you know, we have to decide again and again and again, will I give myself to what the Word of God says? Will I give myself to what is written in here? Because there are many people who will teach what itching ears wants to hear. This is why we come to church. This is why we have life groups. This is why we do one-to-one discipleship because we cannot become fully one with Jesus until we all attain the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. To mature man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So we must have one identity. We must have one faith. And this will lead us into one purpose. My third point today, one purpose. God has given His church enormous responsibility to make disciples in every nation. Do you agree with this? Do you understand that this is our mandate? Collectively and individually. This is really your job description. You're an accountant so that you can do this. You're a doctor so that you can do this. You go to work so that you can ultimately be released to do this. This is who you are. To go to the nations. It involves preaching and teaching and nurturing and giving, administering, building and making other, you know, many other tasks. If we had to fulfill this command on our own, it will just be overwhelming. Would you agree with that? If you had to do this alone, it will be overwhelming. But God calls us, thankfully, collectively. So some can do something, others can do another. Together we can obey God more fully than any one of us can do in their own strength. It is a human tendency to overestimate what we can do in our own strength and to underestimate what we can do collectively. Do you know what you can do, church, collectively if we share one purpose in Christ Jesus? When we have one purpose, we can express the fullness of Christ. Philippians 2.2 says this, Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, love one another, and working together with one mind and one purpose. Have one purpose. I had an interesting conversation with a church leader recently who told me his view. He said, you know what, this thing of church, you guys, you, you're part of this 412 network. You're all about making churches healthy. You're all about the local church. Uh, I just don't know if the local church should have that much of an of a emphasis, really. Surely we should just love Jesus and we should just really do our very best where we can. And, and he was trying to use Paul as... His, his, his uh, reasoning for thinking in this manner. He was saying, well, actually, if I look at Paul, what Paul was doing is Paul was going out into the world. He was just taking the gospel wherever he went. And that's true, right? But the reality is Paul, wherever he went, he would preach the gospel. Where people would give their life to Christ Jesus, he would establish a church. And then according to a specific pattern, he would then get that church to be healthy. He would raise up elders who can govern and lead and pray and, and teach he would raise up spirit-filled deacons who can serve the body and work in the church. They would be spirit-filled believers who will take the gifts that God has placed within them and serve the life of the church. And then what would happen when that church is healthy? Paul would go to the next place and establish a new church. And even when he was in prison and he couldn't do it, he would be writing letters to churches to help them into health, rather than sitting there writing long letters of lamentation about his horrible situation and how unfair everything is. He was writing letters to churches to get them healthy. And Paul would say, I pray continuously. How often do you see in the letters that Paul writes in the New Testament that he says, I'm praying for you continuously? He carried a burden for the local church. Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. I feel Paul understood this very carefully and very, very clearly. For there the Lord has commanded a blessing and life forevermore. With His unity, God commands a blessing. Isn't that amazing? 
And I want to conclude with this. It wasn't just Paul who had gone from place to place. I think Paul looked at Jesus and he saw what Jesus was doing. And that's probably why, you know, he was just always determined to keep going. You know, Jesus during his earthly ministry was always on the move. And Luke records the following in Luke chapter 4. It says this, When it was day, he departed and went into a desolate place. And the people sought him and came to him and would have kept him from leaving. People were trying to keep Jesus from going onwards. Stay with us. Let's just be here. Everybody's happy. It's amazing. People are being healed. They're listening to your teaching, Jesus. Let's just stay together. But Jesus said to them, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well. For I was sent for this purpose. I was sent for this purpose. Jesus would heal people. He would be powerfully delivering men and women from demonic oppression. He was teaching with an authority unlike the scribes and the Pharisees and the Bible teachers and the church leaders of that day. He wasn't swayed by public opinion. He didn't allow established religious culture to depict how he conducted himself. Jesus was not interested in money or human praise. Great crowds vied for his attention, his company, and his counsel. Jesus could have just set up shop somewhere, anywhere, and said, I'll stay here. If people want to come and hear me, they must come. They, they'll just come from all over. But he didn't. He could have had the most dynamic, amazing, mega church in history. No doubt it would have been super successful. However, his purpose was always to reach more, to keep going, not to settle and get comfortable, to be outwards looking. So when the people tried to keep him from leaving, he said, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to other towns as well. Why, Jesus? Why do you have to go? He says, I was sent for this purpose. We are united with Christ Jesus, and his purpose remains our purpose. Would you agree with that, church? His purpose remains ours. And Jesus was going from town to town. His message would be clear, and I'm going to conclude with this. In John 14, 6, Jesus would say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. And this is what it means. This is what it means. The Bible would teach that all of us, every single one of us, is born into a sin-tainted, sinful, broken world. All of us are sinners. Every single one of us. And the Bible also says at one point in time, every single one of us, every single one of us will give an account of our lives to God. Every single one of us. The long and the short of it is this. You're going to give an account of your life and everything that you thought, every action, every inaction, in your own strength, on your own merit, trying to defend your own corner, or you're going to stand next to Jesus. And Jesus is going to say, I paid the price. I carried the consequences. I've taken it so that you can be free. My justification is now yours. And this was the message that Jesus was taking out and his followers was taking out, saying, listen, the day is coming for each and every one of us. Why not? Why not with Jesus? Why would you want to be apart from him? First John 5, 11 and 12 says this, and this is what God has testified. He has given us eternal life and this life is in his son. Whoever has the Son has what? Has what? Life. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have God's Son does not have life. His purpose remains our purpose, individually and corporately. And I want to finish with this today. You know, this church, uh, it was so nice to hear Rulf speak a little bit earlier about just your, your heart and your servant heart. And let me tell you, there's so much that you do on an ongoing basis to keep this church operating and in health, whether it's in kids' work or whether it's the guys there week after week, you know, working on the band at the front, you know, or, or, or whether you're giving your time, your talent, or your treasure. You give so much. And you guys are amazing. I, I just, this is an amazing church. For all the visitors, this is a bit of a brag, but I, you know, I just, this is an amazing church. 
This church have birthed three congregations. This church birthed Douglas Congregation, and then it birthed the congregation in Peel, and then it birthed the congregation in Ramsey. And now Douglas had had a little, you know, little mini plant as well, which I'm going to claim as well. There's nobody here from Douglas to defend them, but, you know, I'm claiming that as well. This family, you, this church family, have birthed five congregations or four other congregations. Let me tell you, at the moment, we're, I think, anything between 550 and 600 saints meeting on a Sunday across five congregations from this congregation. Why? Because His purpose is our purpose. Listen, man, He said go to the nations. Don't get fat and happy in one place. You know, just sit and say, Jesus, you're here. Let's just stay here. Let's just keep, you know, the good times rolling. Say, no, 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 just keep going because this is my purpose. You know, 600 may sound like a lot, but it's actually, it's a, it's a, it's a drop. It's actually not that great. Yeah, there's 85,000 people on this island. I think all of them need to hear the gospel. All of them have to understand what Jesus did for them. Everyone should have the choice to decide for themselves, yes, I want what Jesus is offering freely as a gift to take my broken, sinful life away and give me life eternal for free or reject it. But for us, the body of Christ, we must keep going. And so this is why Rulf spoke about it. Guys, we, we feel whenever we plant a new church, new people come to faith. Whenever we establish a new work, new people come to Jesus. It's not just people transferring from different churches. Actually, you want them to stay in their own churches. You want to see people who don't know Jesus come to know Him as their personal Lord and Savior. And it seems that this happens whenever a new church is established. Man, that this will be like the old days of the Methodists. And there'd be churches in every, every corner, man, every place on this island, just like pockets of people who love Jesus so much that they change the spiritual atmosphere of that place. Because they're praying and they're interceding. Wherever they're driving, when they're driving through the village, they're praying for the local shops. You know, as they're walking past people, they, they're praying for them and blessing them. I love it, you know, when, whenever we're shopping and buying stuff, when, when you're paying, you're saying, bless you, God bless you. You know, people who change the spiritual atmosphere, people who carry the Holy Spirit. And this island be scoured with pockets of people like that. Not just living hope. Hear me well. The body of Christ. So what we want to do is we want to go and join with the Anglicans and the Methodists and Elam Church in Castletown saying, come, let's pick up this thing together. Let's run together. We'll blow some wind into your sails. Let's go together. And here's how it's going to work. In years from now, you're going to be able to look back and say, I was part of that. Hey, I wasn't just a spectator reading in a book about some great work God was doing somewhere far away. I was part what God was doing in that season and what He continues to do. Who wants to be part of that? I want to be part of that. It's wonderful to read about the mighty works that God had done through men and women of old. But let me tell you, He's working today. And He's looking for men and women who would say, yes, here I am, send me. Are we united with Him? One identity, one faith, one purpose.